Thanks for listening to the Adulting is Easy podcast, where we make adulting easier by making money easier. This is your host, Lauren, and I'm joined today by Rachel Hernandez, an award-winning mobile home investor with over 10 years of experience. As an author and blogger, her books have hit number one on Amazon, and her blog has been featured as one of the top 20 real estate investing blogs. Rachel is also the number one writer for mobile homes on Quora. She has been featured in MH Village, Forbes, Experian, and various real estate publications and blogs. Her podcast, Adventures in Mobile Homes, is recognized as one of 30 Asian American podcasts to support and was nominated for a 2020 Golden Crane Award by the Asian American Podcasters Association. Rachel, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Lauren, for having me here. I'm glad to be here on the show. It's quite a bio. I'm a little intimidated, but I'll try to get through it. Okay. So our goal for today is make adulting easier for listeners by discussing a personal finance topic since managing money is a big part of adulting. Today, Rachel, given your bio, obviously, we're going to talk about mobile homes. I like to start here. What is a mobile home? Sure. Well, it's basically what it is. Um, if you uh, look at the word mobile, home is basically a home that is mobile. So what's great about mobile homes versus other assets of real estate investing, such as um, single family homes, apartment buildings, duplexes, is that mobile homes or manufactured homes, as they call them now, are mobile. So you can move them from one place to another. So that's the great thing about mobile homes, that they actually are mobile. And the history of mobile homes is actually, if you think back way back, this was I think it was back in the 40s and 50s, they were actually for wealthy people. And if you think about those old, they call them Airstream travel trailers. That was the original mobile home on wheels. And what these more well-to-do families would do is travel across the country to you know visit different parts of the United States. Uh, with their mobile home, their travel trailer. They still sell them. They're called Airstreams. And they would hook them to either their truck or their car. And it's just a chance for the family to actually uh, travel around the uh, around uh, across the country. So that now mobile homes look different. Uh, so the progression of the mobile home after the 50s, it went to the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and now 2000s and beyond. So now you see a mobile home in these communities. They're basically blocked and set. They do take off the wheels most of the times, and they also take off the hitch, which is the connection to these manufactured homes. They used to call them trailers. Now they're actually manufactured homes. So. <laughs> How many times are mobile homes typically moved or manufactured homes typically moved during their life? Sure. Well, the first time the manufactured home is moved is actually from the manufacturer itself. So whatever manufactured company uh, produces the mobile home, they basically get set uh, you know, sometimes they get set on the lots from the dealerships. It's kind of like a car dealership, if you think about it, because they're the ones that are actually selling the homes. So you've got the manufacturers who make the homes, and then you've got the dealerships that sell the homes, kind of like cars. So that's one time. And then it gets placed from, if it goes from the dealership or straight from the uh, manufacturer itself to the lot or the land, wherever it goes. And then from there, it really depends on the homeowner how many times they want to move it. And a lot of times that will have to deal with a lot of uh, restrictions in the community in terms of land and lots. And you have to check with the deed restrictions and there's moving permits, all kinds of things. But a home can be moved as many times as it allows in the jurisdiction where you want to place it in and move it out of, Sue. Are these registered and insured like vehicles? Uh, yes, they are actually, the interesting part about manufactured homes is pre-1976, there weren't much standards in terms of making them, but 1976 and beyond, 
HUD, which is the Department of Housing and Urban Planning, got involved and made standards to make these manufactured homes because pre-1976, there were some issues like aluminum wiring would caught, catch on fire, things like that. So they wanted to make them safe homes. So they actually got involved, got in, involved, you know, overseeing these manufacturers and had standards to make them. So basically 1976 and beyond, then they had identification numbers and they had to pass all the standards within the manufactured uh, uh, factory that they're made in as well too. So now there's standards. Okay, good. Well, that, that's helpful. Thank you for that background, Rachel. So how did you become mobile home girl? Sure, no problem. Well, I wasn't always mobile home girl. I actually started in real estate investing, just like a lot of people who get started, basically single family homes. I started out as a bird dog finding deals for other investors. And then I became a wholesaler. And I put these homes that I found with motivated sellers under contract and assigned my interest to the investors that I was working with. Usually they were either rehabbers or landlord. And then I made a fee, an assignment fee. So back, fast forward a couple of years, I build up cash from my bird dogging and wholesaling business. And then I'm able to purchase properties for cash flow. I become a landlord, like a lot of people. And then I become a burnt out landlord. And every month I noticed that, you know, I was the last to be paid because the first person to get paid from the rent is the mortgage. Then you got insurance and you got homeowners insurance. I even brought in property managers, but I had to pay them as well too. So, you know, at the end of the day, you're not getting much per property as a, uh, you know, full-time landlord, a real estate investor. So at that point, I actually decided to look into other options. I stumbled across uh, Lonnie Scruggs, who's actually the godfather of mobile home investing. And I learned his system of buying, selling, and financing manufactured homes for cash. So basically, I sold all my properties. My single family homes was about $200,000 in cash I made. And I got into mobile home investing and here I am today. So now my business, I've been doing this since 2007, is I've got properties, you know, as a landlord, as a, as a mobile home owner that I've sold, you know, to people, but I've also got um, active income. So I've got passive income from, you know, my properties, but then I've also got active income doing wholesaling. I help sellers sell their homes and then I find buyers usually either homeowners or uh, other investors who want to buy these mobile homes for cash. So that's pretty much what I'm doing today. And it's funny because I've come full circle. Now I'm a wholesaler uh, in the mobile home investing business. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I love, I love that story. And I think I'll, I think it's not atypical. Most people's careers or investing journeys are not completely linear. So that, that makes total sense to me. So mobile homes, I have a question about the financing. And this may be like a Florida problem because maybe they're hard to insure and then therefore hard to finance. I'm not sure, but are there, is it difficult to finance or insure these things? Yeah, typically the older used mobile homes, it is harder if you want to get financing on the buyer end. So basically either you have your own cash, you bring in a partner, uh, you bring in private lenders, or you ask the seller for owner financing. Uh, those are pretty much typically your uh, options. Other options is to talk to local banks and credit unions to see, you know, if there are any financing options available. I've known some of their investors to actually pull home uh, money out of their uh, uh, their homes, like do home equity loans to purchase mobile homes. But it's not something that I actually advocate because it's tied to your own home. So. Yeah, you could lose the mobile home and your home. Yeah, so one thing I did want to mention, I have bought mobile homes on credit cards, but actually it was a time when the rates were low, but then I had some cash coming in from the sale of my other properties. So I was able to uh, pay off the credit card right away. So I don't advocate that, but I just wanted to throw that in there. Buying a home on a credit card. I've done a car, but I haven't done a home. So that's funny. <laughs> that's funny to think about. So something that I don't quite understand from a underwriting the deal perspective is 
most properties are like we have depreciation from like a tax perspective, but it's not like real depreciation. Typically, like the buildings, you replace things here and there, but they're going to hold up almost almost indefinitely. Like the house I'm sitting in right now, uh, over 120 years old. With mobile homes, that's not really the case that I'm aware of. How do you deal with it's actually a depreciating structure? Yeah. And a lot of people ask me that about, you know, mobile homes, manufactured housing, and I'm not really in it for the appreciation. I mean, it's great, you know, when the market's like how it is now and you can sell these things for more than you purchased them for. But in terms of depreciation, I'm really more into it for the cash flow and the people who actually buy them, like the buyers I work with, they're in it for the cash flow or a place to live. So at the end of the day, it's basically affordable housing. But, you know, depending on your location uh, where you are, you know, um, I'm in Texas, but I'm not on the coast. I'm in central Texas. Uh, so basically the weather's been pretty tame compared to if you're on the coast, the East Coast or the West Coast with hurricanes and all. You probably know that, <laughs> Lauren. Uh, <laughs> basically, you know, the people who actually I tend to work with, uh, they've been living in manufactured homes, mobile homes for generations. And so the people, they're just like single family homes. There are people who take care of their homes and there's people who don't take care of the homes. And so when I'm selling a home on owner financing, I make sure I tell them, you know, the buyers that you've got to take care of the home. You know, some of the parks, the communities I work in, they actually have quarterly inspections of the home. You know, if you're taken back on owner financing and stuff like that. I don't mm. do that unless the manager tells me, because I do invest in these communities that, Rachel, that home that you own, that you're doing seller financing for, it looks like, you know, they're not keep, keeping it up. Can you talk to them? You know, and usually be a cosmetic thing. But for the most part, um, if you choose the right people to live in the homes, if you're either renting them out or doing seller financing, um, and just stay on top of that. It just comes down to just replacing things, normal wear and tear. Um, unless the home, you bought the home and they didn't take care of the home, things just need to be replaced on a regular basis. And, you know, you got to watch these things, especially when it comes to siding, so the hardy board, wood siding. And, you know, if it rains a lot, you've got to really watch that too. So just some things to think about. What kind of interest rates are you getting on your seller financing deals? Uh, typically, you know, what uh, Lonnie does is basically he did like 12.75%. So basically what I do is I do a lease wish option to purchase. So basically it's separated. You've got your lease and then you've got your option. And then within that period, then, you know, if they want to purchase it, then they can. So basically the way I do it is you can't, I don't really do say do rent credits, but basically they actually get something. They earn those credits because it's a lot of legalese and all that towards the home. You know what I mean? So you got to have it structured. I advise talking to an attorney if you're going to um, do it that way, but it's just saved me heartache because a lot of times, you know, these people, people move every five to seven years. And I've got, if I've got on a 10, 15 year, you know, note, then something could happen. So people like that. Okay. If something has, has to happen where, you know, I get, I have a family member that gets sick or I lose my job and, you know, it's, it, people divorce. That's the, one of the highest uh, rates of, you know, what I do, I take back these homes, you know, I've taken one home. I took back like three or four times, you know, wow. So, you know, you never know it's going to happen, but people have like that peace of mind, like I'm putting something towards this, but at the same time I can get out of this, you know what I mean? So that's kind of how I handle it. Yeah, that's interesting. So we've touched on some of these things, but I wanted to just ask the question straight out. How does investing in mobile homes differ from investing in single family homes or other asset classes? Sure. Well, the first thing, you know, it's different because if you're doing it like what I'm doing with lawn, like Lonnie Scruggs did, you're buying them in these communities, in these mobile home parks. 
before you can invest or buy those properties, you've got to build a rapport with the park manager, the park owner, and make sure that it's actually okay to do business in these communities. Now, this is more of an art than an exact science. So it may take a couple trips to get out there and build rapport. You know, I do teach about this, like how to approach the park manager. It's on my podcast, Adventures of Mobile Homes. But, you know, it's just one of those things, like if you can get into these communities and maybe there's just a couple investors there, you know, that's the main difference. Then you're like, you know, closing out the competition, less competition for you. You could be the only you could be the only person buying these homes as an investor in these communities, you know, and what I like about it is these communities have been there, been there for a long time, you know, because there is a history of manufactured housing, mobile home parts in the United States, and they're not building more of these, you know, to, to, you know, as far as I know. So, cause they're federally regulated. So that's just one of the good things, less competition. So that's the main difference. I would see less competition than single family homes. Cause you know, there's a lot of people in who get into single family homes first, just pretty much like what I did too. So. Well, yeah, that's by default. I think a lot of us grew up in single family homes or certainly new people in single family homes. So it's a very comfortable environment for us. I will say both of my grandmothers currently live in manufactured homes. Oh, cool. um, so <laughs> yes. And I was going to ask this question too. So one of my grandmas double wide on her own two acres. Okay. My other grandma double wide on the water in this like mobile home park. That's a co-op. How, like what, why are mobile homes often in co-ops? At least in my area, it's hard to, in some cases, find a mobile home sitting by itself or that you can actually purchase by itself. Yeah, the reason why there are co-ops is because a co-op is different than a mobile home park. In the mobile home park without a co-op, the land is owned by the park, okay? And then the mobile homes are sitting on top. You know, the residents can own them or not own them. The park could own them. But if the residents own them, they have to pay something called lot rent. And the mm -hmm. lot rent goes up and up and up and up. And if they don't own the land, there's always a chance that the mobile home park owner or the mobile home manager can ask them to leave, you know, and there's laws, you know, depending on what state. So in a co-op, you actually have ownership of that community, kind of like a condo association co-op, you know, in a condo on the on the uh, East Coast in New York, you have ownership of that. So you know that that piece of land is, or that park is not going to be sold from right under you. Because a lot of times across the country, sometimes these mobile home park owners, they just sell the park and then they sell to developer. And then they tell the people, well, you guys got to get off of this land and move your homes and people don't know. So there's always that chance living in a manufactured housing community. Could it happen? Yeah. Usually the bigger ones that are, you know, corporate managed, which I, I work in four or five star parks, usually it doesn't happen, but the smaller mom and pops, it could happen, you know? So with a co-op, you have that peace of mind, you own a piece of that co-op that it can't be sold from underneath you of course obviously you're you're buying into something kind of like a condo association so there's going to be fees there's going to be rules are going to be, you know, you got to vote for board members and stuff like that, but it just gives you peace of mind. If I'm living here long-term, it could never be sold out from underneath. You know what I mean? Yep. So you're buying, it sounds like individual single family homes. Have you thought about buying a whole park? Yes, I have. Actually, I've been approached several times <laughs> to buy parks, but I remember Lonnie Scruggs because I've met, you know, I met him when he was alive that he told me, I asked him, Lonnie, why have you not bought in a park? You have so much experience doing this. And he said, basically, he did not buy a park because he's like, once you buy a park, you're in a different business. You're not in the owner financing business. You're not in the bank lending business. You are in the management business. And his whole thing, why he was doing it was for cash flow, was for freedom so that him and his wife could travel across the country in an RV. So that's always at the back of my mind. I know a lot of park owners and they were just, they're in partnerships and they're managing things and they got to fly out everywhere. And I just don't know if I want that 
life at this point, but we'll see, you know, in the future, I am looking at investing in land and having homes on top of the, the land as well too, more on a smaller scale, but in terms of an entire park, it's in the back of my mind, but I just haven't pursued it because I do value my time. So, <laughs> so talking about a specific deal, can you give us an example of maybe one where a recent deal where you're, what the numbers look like, what you bought it for, maybe what the cash flow would be if it, you rented it out versus what the cash flow is like if you sell or finance, just some kind of tangible example for us. Sure. No problem. Well, my most important deal was my first deal. So my first deal, it was a two bedroom, one bath, mid 1980s home. The family that lived there had been there for 10 years. And I basically, I already got in with the park manager. The par It was at the beginning of my career. It took me eight months, almost a year to put this deal together and find it. So basically they found me just because I was passing out flyers in the park. I had actually asked the park manager if I can do business in there, took a couple trips and she's like, okay, fine. And I was like, well, I'm going to be like going door to door, passing out flyers, blah, blah, blah. So I started posting flyers on these doors. You know, I'm very, very old school when it comes to marketing. Um, I'm not the most technology savvy person, but a lot of do, I do a lot of marketing techniques that I did, you know? So, you know, I get a call and the wife calls me and she said, you know, I noticed your flyer, we're moving. There was no for sale by owner sign on the home. She said, we just want to sell this to someone we can trust, someone who's going to be honest. We don't want all these people going through our home. We don't even want to deal with that, you know? And this is the niche what I'm finding with these mobile homes sellers, these motivated sellers, they just want to deal with the hassle of selling a home. So I said, well, how much do you want for it? And she's like, well, that's the thing. We, me and my husband and, you know, our family, we want to meet you and then we'll discuss it. And at that point I was an experienced investor, you know, obviously because I was in single family homes, you know, I could have just not gone to the appointment and said, oh, they're not motivated. They're not serious. They won't even give me a number. Or I could have just gone and see, you know, what happened? What else do I have to lose? So I went over there to make a long story short. It was just basically cosmetic repairs. They even cleaned it before they moved out. So we negotiated. They were asking, I think they started at five. Then they went to four. I got them to 3,600 cash. Then I told them, you know, you guys got to clean this home. It had central heat and air conditioning, which is great. And they moved out of the home. They got their money. I filled that home in two weeks with owner financing. They gave me a thousand dollars down, two fifty per month for the next four and a half years. I sold it for about ten thousand dollars. So that was the most important deal to me because it was my, you know, my first deal. Uh, fast forward a couple months, I do a wholesale deal. This was just a couple months from now. Okay, I do a wholesale deal. Uh, I find a seller, and uh, they want they had this home for sale. I'm like, well, I can't buy this. You know, this is they were asking a lot, and they're like. Well, um, what do you, what can you do? You know, because they really wanted to move out of the area. They wanted to, you know, buy a single family home. And I said, well, I can help you sell it. I'm like, okay, let's see if I can wholesale this. So to make a long story short with this other family, and this was just a couple of months ago, they wanted 30,000 for the home. I sold it and I got 8,000. I was asking, I think 38, 40,000 for it. I found a buyer in one day for that home because I have a network of dealerships. They took the home, they moved it out of the, the park two hours to their piece of land. And I made $8,000 in the span of like three days because we had to do the paperwork and stuff. So that's my like latest wholesale deal a couple months ago that I did too. So just an example. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Okay. So you have the you have the one you bought it for 3600, you sold it for 10,000 mm -hmm. and you got that along the way, the the increments of money, right? Not like right. The big, not the 10,000 at the end. So that's kind of cool too. And then you have this wholesale deal. Well, but first when you're saying 3600, I'm like, how do you wholesale something that's 3600? Like, like <laughs> they were asking five. I'm like you had 30 you're going to wholesale it from 36 to 5. But that's so I'm glad that you included that wholesaling example of where the seller wanted 30, you sold it for 38 and you got $8,000. Like that's, that's awesome for like a couple of weeks of work. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it happened so fast. Like, I believe I went there on a Saturday. 
I put it on a contract on Saturday. I actually called my dealerships and we had buyers go through it on Sunday. We had a buyer. They're like, we want it. They put a deposit on Sunday. They gave me, a, I think, $1,000. We close on Tuesday, so I get 7000 So I made $8,000 in like three days. So it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Three days, but also 10 years, right? Because yes. you have all of that experience and yes. all of those relationships and all of the confidence needed to do this. I don't, I just didn't want a listener to think like, okay, cool. I'm going to go out there and like next week I'm going to have wholesale my first. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so this is my last question for you. What do you think the future holds for mobile or manufactured homes? I think there's a bright future for manufactured housing uh, since it's been around, you know, it's part of American history, you know, and also, you know, I have people who are readers in other countries like Canada, Ireland, Australia, they call them caravans, actually, in uh, other parts of the world, like Europe. <laughs> Uh, I didn't even know they were in Ireland until a reader told <laughs> me about them. But I think the future is bright because of that history. And the people who tend to buy these manufactured homes, they grew up with them. You know, like you mentioned your grandmother. Uh, they they actually have family, generations of family, generations of friends who buy them. But now there's a new uh, class of people who are looking at them because of affordable housing and the way the real estate um, industry is now, you know, people are looking at other options. Uh, so you've got, you know, young people, you've got older generations looking who never would have thought because they're downsizing. And then now you've got tiny homes as well, too. Yeah. I think tiny homes are, you know, are a big deal right now and they're in urban, but you can also, I've seen them in, you know, out there on pieces of land as well, too. So because these homes are mobile, whether they're manufactured homes, tiny homes, I mean, there's RVs as well, too, which is more the older generation that, you know, I think that gives people options. So I think they're here to stay and they are affordable as well, too. I agree with that completely. Uh, so Rachel, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Yes. So for anyone interested in learning more about mobile home investing, I have a free class on my website, Adventures in Mobile Homes. It's basically on the landing page. You cannot miss it. So you can check out the free training class uh, for mobile home investing on adventuresinmobilehomes.com. I also have a book, Adventures in Mobile Homes, How I Got Started in Mobile Home Investing and How You Can Too which, you know, a lot of people, you know, if you just want to get started and learn more about it. And then I also have a podcast, Adventures in Mobile Homes, where I go into different topics within mobile home investing. Like I talked about, you know, talking to the park manager. I have uh, actually a couple uh, episodes on that and, and a couple about uh, wholesaling as well, too. But the last thing I wanted to share was that my investment story was actually in J.L. Collins' new book that's coming out actually next week, <laughs> Halloween, and it's called Pathfinders. And J.L. Collins is the international best-selling author of the book, uh, The Simple Path to Wealth. So definitely check it out. I just finished reading Pathfinders. Great read. Great read for sure. All right. And you can find me on Twitter slash X. At adulting is easy on Instagram at adulting is easy real YouTube at adulting is easy. This video will be there. If you like this episode, you'll also like episode 117 real estate as a side hustle and finding your tribe online. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Hopefully Rachel and I have made adulting a little easier for you. Mm -hmm.